Thank you very, very much, Bill, for that wonderful introduction. What has happened, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, uh, uh, the shock to energy prices, food prices, uh, are really uh, unprecedented, very big events. Uh, and uh, what happened uh, has, I think, made us think a lot about, rethink a lot about macroeconomics. Uh, and uh, macroeconomic theory. Uh, I'm not going to go through uh, all of, of how th this ought to have led to our rethinking. What I'm going to illustrate uh, is a little bit is with some numbers uh, uh, applied to this particular situation, uh, why the standard approach in macroeconomics is very badly flawed. Uh, and those who use the standard tools have come to the uh, very peculiar conclusion that uh, uh, our success is our enemy and we ought to stop uh, being successful. And uh, they be they, they've begun uh, being successful in uh, uh, their attempt, those of you who uh, uh, watched uh, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, uh, that was a, a, a kind of disturbance to our financial system uh, that was predicted, predictable and predicted uh, what would happen if we rapidly increased interest rates. Most people agreed we had to normalize them. There was something very peculiar about zero interest rates. That's not the cost of capital, the shadow price of capital, and uh, we, they had been abnormally low for a very long time, and uh, it, it was time to normalize them. In fact, the one of the fears of the rapid and excessive increase in interest rates was that because there had been this long period of zero interest rate, the trauma to our economic system would be all that much greater. Um, I've been very concerned, of course, with developing countries and emerging markets, and they also have been experiencing uh, this. Uh, uh, almost weekly, the IMF increases the number of countries on the, uh, that are in the list of those about to have stress. Uh, and when they say stress, what that means is they have to cut back on the expenditures, on health and education. Uh, they face real trauma, even, you know, a, 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 some of them have gone over the brink. Uh, but the fact that the United States itself has had several banks go over the brink precisely because of this. And let me just mention, uh, emphasize the Silicon Valley Bank that went bankrupt. It wasn't from bad lending. It wasn't that their loans went bad. It was the term structure of interest rates that was changing as a result of the kinds of action that the Fed had undertaken. So it was unambiguous what had happened was twofold the result of the Fed. First, and the current uh, uh, chairman of the Fed. Uh, first, uh, they decided uh, not to regulate uh, what they call regular, uh, 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 not the banks that were not the largest banks. So this turned out to be the second largest ba uh, uh, failure of a bank in our history, probably in the world, but, but certainly in, in, in our history. It was a big deal. And uh, it had enormous consequences for the most dynamic part of the US economy with one half of all star uh, startups dependent on capital. Uh, and uh, firms in Silicon Valley not being able to meet their payroll. Uh, they were the threat of, of having to lay off their workers or ha asking their workers, go work for nothing. So uh, uh, this was trauma. And so the same Federal Reserve that decided we didn't need regulation then changed interest rates so much that the absence of regulation, by regulation including stress testing, to see if uh, uh, there would be this kind of disturbance, they, uh, they, they then put the stress that they should have tested, but said, we don't need a test, 
And then there was a discussion on, just one more thing before I get into my subject, because I'm very uh, uh, exercised by this. Um, uh, they said, well, if, some people said, well, there'll be moral hazard if you uh, uh, bail out the depositors. Well, how can somebody who is in the business of trying to run a business or just an ordinary individual who's saving investigate the balance sheet of the bank if the regulator can't tell whether the bank is fragile? The regulator said it's okay. In fact, in testimony to Congress, he said just a couple of days before our financial system is sound. If he's saying this, how is an ordinary American is supposed to be able to figure out whether uh, his bank is sound? And if you know a mark of a, a civilized society, a, you know a working economy is you put your money in the bank. And if it's announced that it is a bank, you should be able to expect to get your money back uh, from the bank. Uh, it's not a gambling casino. It's not, you know, you know, there are some things where you don't expect to get your money back. But here, you expect to get your money back. Um, and then they say, oh, it's moral hazard. They should have spent uh, days of their life trying to figure out whether they're looking at the bank's balance sheet when the chairman of the Federal Reserve hadn't done that. <laughs> so uh, that's the background for a failed monetary policy. Uh, I'm looking at this more broadly from uh, macroeconomics and some of the debates that were going on. Uh, as I said, and I think that they throw a lot of, shed a lot of light on macroeconomic and macroeconomic um, uh, policy more generally. Um, where do I? Point it. Ah, oops, I went too far. Uh, oops, I went. Um, so this downturn and the inflationary episode is different from earlier episodes, uh, and it is uh, important not to draw wrong lessons from past experiences. A lot of people make reference to what happened 50 years ago, the economy is very different, and this shock is very different. Uh, there are important sectoral issues, uh, and it's precisely because it's sectoral issues that traditional aggregate models uh, may not be uh, serviced well. Uh, there's some extreme uncertainty, and that affects behavior. And uh, those of you who've suffered through st studying standard macroeconomics, they typically don't put much emphasis on uncertainty. They put much more emphasis on intertemporal allocation. And here, the key issue is risk and uncer extreme uncertainty. And uh, thirdly, there are large distributional issues. Now, I'm going to illustrate all this with US data. I apologize. I didn't have time to do it for other countries. I think we'll have some uh, data from other countries. Uh, and that's what the OECD does great, uh, that you do bring together in a standardized way data from other co countries, but the principles are the same. And uh, I think uh, looking at these issues from a perspective across countries is an important uh, agenda. So the key message is I've gotten a little ahead of my story, uh, is that this inflation is caused not by excess aggregate demand, and especially not caused by excessive pandemic spending, but by supply side shocks and demand shifts related to the pandemic and war. Um, this, uh, I won't have time to go into it, but the standard way of trying to break that down uh, makes some fundamental confusions because when you have a supply shortage in one sector, it can show up as a demand effect in another sector. But the underlying shock is the supply side shock. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of uh, studies, some of you said that a third of it is demand. Those are because they haven't uh, looked at the fact that the supply shock leads to a demand shock, and the real source of the shock is the underlying supply shock. So the, the numbers that you sometimes see bandied around a third those studies are really very badly flawed. Um, and as I said, the simple accurate models are not very helpful. And uh, the uh, 
two points I want to uh, come to towards the end of the policy is that raising interest rates is likely to be counterproductive, uh, let alone destabilizing. And uh, there are a range of other policy responses that are likely to be more, uh, more productive. So uh, let me begin by talking about the sectoral issues. Uh, these were uh, shocks to particular uh, sectors. In particular, the pandemic affected the service sector uh, much more than it did uh, other sectors of the economy. Um, this is true, actually, in other, uh, in, in other economic downturns. And it's a critique that I've had of macroeconomics in general is that some of the big issues can't be addressed from a macro point of view. So the Great uh, Depression was a shock to the agricultural sector, where relative prices in the agric agricultural sector fell 75%. So those of you studying some economics know that you can use aggregates when relative prices are relatively constant. But when the price of a major sector of the economy, and at that time agriculture was a major sector economy, fell by 75%, the aggregation theorems that allow you to use macroeconomic aggregates fail. So uh, uh, that's the underlying, you might say, theoretical perspective. Um, the uh, example, as I said, it, it was so clear that the pandemic was a sectoral shock. It affected the service sector much more than others. And this is just a, ch a chart that shows uh, how differing sectors uh, went down uh, disproportionately. Um, so uh, what I'm going to claim here is that uh, the source of the inflation relates to, uh, again, sectoral shocks. Uh, sectoral supply shocks and uh, 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 pandemic-induced supply shortages, uh, the interruptions in global supply chains, uh, chip shortages, um, which had a particularly large effect in the auto sector. And if you look at the timing of the increase in inflation, uh, say in the United States, it was all related in the beginning to auto. So it wasn't like there's excess demand, it was auto uh, prices. And I'll come back to talk about particular sectors where there's a, a big problem. Well, uh, the reason why I want to I emphasize this is raising interest rates is not going to lead to a solution to the chip shortage. In fact, it can interfere with the production that would lead to a reduction of the uh, supply shortage. Um, it took a while to address the problem of chip shortages. I talked to uh, the CEO of Volkswagen. He gave me a whole list of reasons why they were having uh, difficulties, uh, why it wasn't as temporary as people thought it should have been. But what is true is right now we have a, a surplus of chips. And right now what we have is uh, inventories of cars building up and the price of cars coming down. So we didn't know, because this was an unusual crisis, we didn't know how long it was going to take. But so it could be a year, it could be three years, four years. We should feel happy it didn't take four years. But uh, the fact is, it was not, it was a temporary shock. Um, and then there are notions of uh, demand shifts. Uh, one uh, aspect uh, that's particularly important is, uh, in the U.S. and in some other countries is that uh, because people didn't have to go into work, in fact, they couldn't go into work, uh, and where you lived didn't make any difference. And the advantages of being in New York, which I think are great, uh, disappeared if you couldn't interact with anybody. So if you're going to be alone, you might as well be alone with nature and commune with nature. So everybody left uh, the city. So uh, there were shortages in uh, upstate New York, and the price of housing in upstate New York went way up. There were surpluses. A third of the apartments in our building were empty. But the rents and the prices went down, but very little. 
And of course, the price indices reflect the average. So given asymmetries of responses, demand shifts are going to show up in inflation. But just as a footnote, this is an example where our metrics are badly flawed because like in the United States, we use imputed housing in our CPI, in our uh, measure of, we use uh, imputed rental and two thirds of Americans don't rent. And the rental prices don't really reflect the cost uh, of, of the, that individuals face. So two thirds of the population didn't face an increase in cost of housing. Uh, and yet, the, in, the numbers that were coming out said uh, that their cost of living was going up. Um, what was true was there was an unexpected lack of resilience of markets, uh, which I think is a consequence of short-sightedness, something that we ought to think about going forward. And uh, it's been a big part of the G20, G7 agenda to think about, for the first time, resilience. There was a lot of exercise of market power. Uh, markups went up enormously, and they went up more in those sectors and in those firms where there was evidence of market power before the crisis. Uh, that's very important uh, for another reason. Uh, since I may run out of time, I thought, let me mention some of these uh, that, that is important. Because sometimes the Fed says, look at the wages going up. That's obviously going to get translated into inflation. But that basic reasoning is, is flawed. Wages can go up without prices going up if markups come down. And I'll show you a, a, a little while how dramatically markups went up because of the unusual nature of the crisis the pandemic and, and, and the, the war. So the, uh, the, the idea that wage tr increases get translated in the way they would in a stable situation into price increases is just wrong in the particular context uh, that we're talking about. Um, of course, all these uh, pandemic-induced uh, uh, shortages and demand shifts were exacerbated by the uh, war. Um, and I put a, a, a sentence in here because uh, I was told I should make this a little bit more uh, uh, beyond America, provincial American. Uh, I, I put in a, a point here that uh, the effects of the war on uh, the cost of living and on uh, the European economy have been exacerbated because you have a very, uh, in general, uh, uh, Europe has a very flawed uh, model for pricing electricity. And so uh, the uh, changes in gas prices got translated into a very large change in electricity prices that if you had had a, what I would have designed as a better system of electricity pricing, you would not have had that much uh, uh, that that the extent of inflation. France has done better than other European countries. Norway is the example on the other side, where Norway, a, a resource-rich country, with both hydroelectric, gas, and oil, electricity prices went up eightfold, and uh, at the same time that the the uh, the state-owned uh, companies were making huge profits. Ordinary citizens in the country were facing uh, dramatic stresses. And you say, what kind of a, a economic system does that? And then people say, well, we have to provide the right incentives. But if you thought, think that the war is going to last only for a short time, why would you change your basic modes of production or modes of consumption? You're not going to put in insulation that you didn't have before if you think the war is going to last for six weeks or six months or you know, a year. Um, so the, the distributive effects of the electricity pricing model were enormous relative to the allocative effect. And the result was much more uh, inflation than had to be the case. Um, and then in, in all countries, uh, some of the inflation was imported uh, caused by increases in the prices of imported good. So uh, the good news is uh, that the market uh, is responding, inflation 
uh, is falling. So um, uh, this shows uh, the uh, pattern in prices, but what that doesn't fully uh, reflect uh, because they, they, these changes are year over year, um, they don't reflect what is actually going on month by month. So if you look over the last six months uh, in the United States, uh, the rate of inflation has been just over 2%. And there were many macroeconomists that said we had to have 10 years of high inflation, five years of high inflation, of high unemployment, to bring down the rate of inflation. And they've been proven absolutely wrong. And uh, some of what I'm going to say uh, below will explain why they were wrong. And what you can see here is uh, the fact that the uh, price increases were really very concentrated in a particular sector. This was not a uniform in change in prices, uh, very big relative price changes and uh, large increases in the prices uh, of imported goods uh, other than fuel. So it wasn't just a, an energy price. It was uh, a lots of uh, uh, sectors that are affected. Um, um, so um, uh, the service sector is different from the manufacturing and durable goods uh, sector. Uh, it has uh, local market power, uh, which is not well described by the competitive model. Uh, price behavior is markedly different. Um, and this is reflected in, in uh, if you look down again at the microeconomics, uh, the durable goods price surged and then came down. Um, but the service sector prices have continued to increase. And uh, it's not because of wage momentum. Actually, real wages have been declining through much of the period. This is the thing that uh, Bill was worried about. Um, uh, and it's important to note the, uh, something that needs to be explained to some uh, people at the Federal Reserve. The service sector is not always labor intensive. Barbershop metaphor is not always a good one. There are some parts of the service sector are actually very capital intensive. Um, a lot of what was going on has to do with market power. Uh, when you're, a lot of the services are very local services. And so while the market for durable goods is a global market, uh, the market for services is a very local market. Take, take tractors. There's a global market for tractors, but once you buy a, a tractor of a particular kind, like a deer tractor, you are dependent on the local service provider, and there's only one of those, and he has market power. And uh, there have been important changes in market power, um, and uh, um, the fact that the service sector has become more important is one of the reasons why market power has actually uh, uh, increased. So in many ways, economic theory uh, predicted the service sector uh, will have higher inflation, uh, there's a, uh, a theory called customer market theory. Uh, Phelps, Winter, uh, Bruce Greenwell, and I have developed the theory over the last uh, 40, 50 years. And it says that uh, there's always a trade-off between the benefits of raising your prices today versus the risk of losing customers in the future. And when there's greater uncertainty, you put less emphasis on the future and therefore you increase your price today, because in that balance, what happens today uh, 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 matters more. Uh, that kind of reasoning says not only does the increase in certainty associated with the pandemic lead to more inflation, but raising interest rates also leads to more inflation. Uh, the counter of the standard uh, demand theory uh, uh, that that uh, firms set their prices, balancing off the benefits of raising their prices versus the costs, and the higher interest rate encourages them uh, to do that. So here's a chart showing uh, the increase in markups. Uh, one way of thinking about this is this is the declining share of labor. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, what you see is a, a, a secular trend in that. 
going up. But then what you really see is what happened after the pandemic, and that really shoots up. You got to believe that that's abnormal and won't be sustained. And uh, we don't know how long it's going to be, but as those markups come down, inflation will be attenuated. But of course, uh, the, the point that we're just talking about, the higher markups uh, are reflected in higher corporate uh, profits, which you see very dramatically here. So from a policy point of view, the sectoral shocks require sectoral responses, um, and uh, 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 including, for instance, addressing uh, the sectoral bottlenecks. Um, so the second issue I want to talk about are the distributional issues. So uh, it was clear, everybody has pointed out, uh, COVID-19 has exposed and exacerbated the inequalities in our society. But from a macro point of view, it's also exposed the very differ big differences in impact. Um, and, the, uh, and leaving out uh, uh, these distributional effects, as most of the aggregate models do, is leaving out something of first order importance. Uh, so the standard macroeconomic models don't assess, uh, don't look at distribution of income and how it's changing. And when it changes as rapidly as, as, uh, as the, the, the charts like this suggest that it's changing, you really have to think about it. When it doesn't change, you don't want to think about it. But when it's changing, you really, uh, you really do. Um, so uh, here are just some uh, charts that re reflect this. The uh, pandemic had a much more adverse effect on those at the bottom. Uh, but this is a, uh, one of the great things uh, from the point of view economic researchers, not from the point of view of humanity, but one of the great things from the point of view of economic researchers of the pandemic was we had real-time data where we could see what was going on. So it was like a controlled experiment. And so, uh, as you could expect uh, with uh, academic economists, with new sources of data, uh, this was uh, they were thrilled. Uh, and so, the particular thing they could get from uh, some of the uh, um, uh, companies that uh, do credit cards, debit cards, and all that, real-time expenditures day by day, and you could see what happened when people got their stimulus check uh, and did the stimulus check change uh, consumption. Now, standard economics, which doesn't talk about credit rationing, people smooth their income, there's no problem of getting access to money, um, would say, oh, the day you get your stimulus check, that shouldn't make any difference. You, you just smooth your income over. and. Uh, other theory says people at the bottom of the income distribution are living hand to mouth. If they don't have money, they don't consume. So uh, these uh, little charts, which you probably can't see uh, very well, show uh, very forcefully that in rich areas, people do smooth their consumption. They didn't, you know, getting that stimulus check, they just took that check and put it in their, in their bank account. But people who are poor, it meant that they could go out and buy groceries. <laughs> it really did make a difference. So we were really helping people uh, that needed the money. Now, the fact that the rich people didn't spend their money is an important part of the macroeconomic story. Because there were people, foolish people, I won't name them, who said, oh, all this stimulus spending is going to cause inflation. But they were wrong because so much of that stimulus spending just went into a bank account. They didn't spend it. You don't get inflation if people don't spend it. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. The, 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 the point was that aggregate savings in the United States really spiked. We're a country that normally doesn't save very much. 
now because of the great uncertainty, people couldn't go out and, uh, and eat and do all kinds of other things. Savings uh, 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 really uh, soared. And this shows you the extent to which, you, this is a chart of what was called excess savings. That is the savings above the level that was, uh, would have been predicted uh, in the absence of the pandemic. And it really soared. And it also shows that it was spent down only very gradually. You know, if it soared and then went down, that would have meant there was a spending and that would have been inflationary. But they were very cautious in spending, uh, spending this excess savings down. And in fact, a lot of the drawdown on that savings was to pay taxes because we suspended withholding tax and they then had to pay more withholding. And so uh, a lot of that drawdown was just to pay taxes and so didn't have the effect of spending on goods and services. Uh, and this just also emphasizes that uh, the excess savings was also caused by a reduction in outlays because of the importance of precautionary savings that I emphasized uh, before. Um, there are uh, a number of other interesting hypotheses that were bandied around and COVID-19, uh, you know, for economists gave a lot of uh, opportunity to do tests. One of them was uh, we had in the United States a very uh, poorly designed program to help people. Uh, more, most uh, other countries uh, uh, from New Zealand and Europe uh, had programs that were better designed to keep workers attached to their jobs. Um, and uh, that generated a debate in the United States was whether the unemployment we, uh, was uh, being kept high because of uh, too high unemployment benefits. That we, you know, unemployment in the United States spiked at about 30%. In other countries, it was much more moderate. And the question was, to what extent did it remain high because of excess uh, unemployment insurance. And uh, what was, again, interesting from the point of view of economic uh, uh, economists was every state in the United States had a different program. Uh, some of them terminated early, some terminated late, some had bigger uh, programs, some had low. low. So it, we, we, it gives you enormous amount of data variation to test the hypothesis. And uh, at least in this context, it turned out overwhelming the evidence was that the unemployment insurance did not affect uh, unemployment, that it did not induce people to remain unemployed. Um, so um, the, uh, there is some worry uh, in some quarters about what's happening right now the U.S. aggregate savings rate uh, is coming down uh, so significantly, and uh, we're in a situation like we had uh, in the run-up to the 2008 crisis, where the bottom part of the income distribution seems to be consuming more than 100% of their income. And, uh, you know, there's an expression about, you know, what is uh, not sustainable won't be sustained, uh, and it is not sustainable for people to consume year after year more than 100% of their income. So there are some problems in the future. Uh, they're not related to excess pandemic spending. It's really, I think, related to excess inequality. The final point that, make, that is a hallmark of this crisis is uh, the deep uncertainty. Uh, these were unprecedented shocks. Uh, and so you can't use a standard model that assumes uh, there's a well-known probability of the distribution. And that's a standard model that uh, economists and central banks have used. They're called DSG models. Those models just are not relevant for uh, the kind of situation that we've had over and over and over again, 2008, um, 2000, uh, what we have just now, 2001. Uh, so. Uh, uncertainty is uh, key. It's not intertemporal uh, substitution. This is important uh, because we have to think, uh, hopefully clearly, about uh, what 
just because it's unprecedented doesn't mean we don't know anything. We know something. And we have to figure out what do we know and from the past and how do we use what we know from the past to design a, appropriate policies. So, uh, for instance, we know uh, that if there is high unemployment, uh, fiscal policy is likely to work. There are large multipliers. We know that automatic stabilizers can be very uh, uh, effective. So the challenge is to identify uh, the idiosyncratic aspect, aspects of the shock, uh, identify what's transitory versus permanent, and uh, um, in a sense, uh, the key failure of the central banks was not acting too slowly, but not realizing that this inflation was not due to excess accurate demand. Uh, and what they did, I think, may have made uh, things worse and certainly have exposed the global economy to a lot of uh, fragility. So um, let me now go to uh, the second part. I, I've tried to explain why I think this is basically a, a supply side demand shift idiosyncratic shock. And uh, I now want to just spend some uh, moments refuting the view that it's caused by excess uh, demand, or even more strongly, excess consumption caused by excess, uh, excessive pandemic support. Uh, and the basic argument is very simple, that each of the major components of aggregate demand was below trend, and uh, aggregate demand was actually below potential output. Um, there are other indicators like large accumulation of inventories, which are not a sign of excess aggregate demand. And uh, the US had the largest fiscal stimulus, but its inflation is not that much higher than those of other countries uh, and can be accounted for by other factors. So I'll just go through these charts very uh, quickly. This is just, these are just charts where we look at the trend, trends before the pandemic and then extrapolate them and then look at, compare them with the actual data. What you look at here is uh, cons real consumption. All of these, I'm focusing on real numbers, which are adjusted for inflation. Uh, so it's real goods. It's how much people are actually consuming. And what you see is that uh, goods and services that uh, except for a very short period of time, we were just minusculely, uh, minusculely uh, above uh, trend. Um, government expenditures did go a little bit above trend in the pandemic, as you hoped they would be, because they were helping people who were facing a, a disease, but then rapidly came down below trend and have remained well below trend. And investment not as surprisingly, uh, was really hit and uh, went w way below trend and has remained well, well below trend. Uh, as I say, the uh, uh, large accumulation of uh, 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 inventories is a sign of uh, um, uh, uh, that there's not excess demand. Uh, residential housing also went uh, uh, b well below trend. And this is total aggregate demand, uh, putting all C plus I plus G, if you remember, uh, plus in exports, uh, that's below trend. Um, oh, this, uh, this shows residential investment below. And then uh, another way of looking at this is to look at uh, aggregate demand versus the CBO calculation done after the pandemic of what potential output and you see that it's basically always below potential output. Hard to see that excess demand is generating inflation. And here just shows that, you know, uh, there's not that much difference across countries, uh, not what one would have expected if one thought the excessive pandemic spending was what uh, was at the root of the problem. And, uh, Beyond that, there, of course, there are many other differences in policies, one of which uh, uh, is the uh, nature of the uh, labor policies that are markedly different than in other countries. Um, now, of course, one of the questions is, no matter what the source of inflation, whether it's excess demand or, or uh, uh, a supply shock, 
Should we be worried about a, 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 a wage price spiral? Um, and um, the first thing uh, I uh, want to observe is that actually, if you look at the wage adjustments reflected in average wages, they were concentrating sectors that were really, uh, you might say, had abusively low wages. So I would call them just a normalization. Just like we talked about a normalization of interest rates, uh, you know, other countries, if you say you're paying your workers $7.25 an hour, or the minimum wage, as you may know, in uh, um, restaurants in the United States is $2 an hour, um, $2.50 250 an hour, you might say, you know, that's outrageous, but that's what we, that's the minimum wage uh, for restaurant workers. So some of what's going on is just, you might call it a normalization. Um, the, uh, there are some things, uh, if you look at the Phillips curve and the beverage curve, uh, in the initial uh, period, uh, they were, uh, looked like there was a shift. We talked about, in the United States, the great resignation. Uh, workers had such bad working conditions, they decided they didn't want to work anymore. Well, that was a nice discussion for a while, but uh, economists' nor normal interaction was, well, yeah, you know, being at home for a while would naturally make people reflect on how badly they were being treated, but eventually they're going to have to go back to work to live, and so most of us would predicted that it was going to be a process of normalization. We didn't know how long it would take. But then, as Bill pointed out, we are now back to the labor force participation rate that we had before uh, the pandemic. So the great resignation, for which there was an enormous literature, particularly in the popular press, seems to have disappeared. Um, if you look at these curves, there are many reasons to think that the, the event itself had scarred, had changed, let me say, had changed the relationship. Let me just give you one, one example. The quit rate uh, that we observed even today is high for the level of unemployment. Not very high, but it's, it's, it's returned about uh, three-fourths towards the, nor the, the pre-pandemic level. But when you realize that quicks are always going to be high, higher for people who are on their job just a short while. In other words, when you just go to work, you've discovered that your boss is really nasty and you want to leave or that you don't like the work or something like that. So we know that quicks are very high in the first year and then eventually, you know, after five years, they get very low. But because in the United States particularly, there was such a high level of separation. The, remember I said the unemployment rate went up to 30%. That meant a lot of people quit initially. So a lot of people were newly with a, with a new employer. And that would mean that you would expect the quit rate to be higher. So it's not as if people's behavior suddenly has permanently been scarred, changed, it's that the event itself has caused a, a series of changes that the full effects take a long time to work themselves out. Um, and it doesn't seem that those of the Federal Reserve and central banks elsewhere fully have taken on board these, the d dynamic of adjustment. And so they've been looking at the labor market and say, well, it still, still seems peculiar. Let's look at the vacancy rate. Let's look at the quit rate. Uh, they so, show signs of abnormality. What is the best tight test of a tight labor market? The best test, if you have a standard economist analysis, if labor markets are tight, real wages should go up. And what's been happening in real wages? They've been going down. So to my mind, the, the best test of whether we have a really tight labor market is what's happening to real wages. And that also says, we shouldn't uh, be worried about, uh, at this juncture, doesn't mean that we, we need to keep surveillance, we don't need to worry about a wage price spiral. 
And this is particularly true because, as I said earlier, markups can and should decrease. Um, and this just is a chart showing the, uh, uh, the fact that the, there was a spike in wages in uh, uh, the hospitality sector to correct an abnormally low wage, but that has now come down. Um, and uh, the uh, rate of increase of, of uh, salaries of private workers has, has come down uh, dramatically. So the picture today is that inflation, I think, is being tamed. Um, bottlenecks are being resolved. Uh, uh, there are disinflationary forces at play. Um, inflationary expectations remain tame. Uh, it has seeped into the core. And so there, and there is some price price inflation, uh, and overall the disinflationary process may be slow, but we have to remember that the two percent target is totally arbitrary, and the time to get to the target is even more arbitrary, and uh, the cost of getting there quickly may be very high, as evidenced by what's happened at uh, uh, SVB. Um, and um, uh, in fact, there's an argument, uh, I think persuasive, that with asymmetries of adjustment, higher inflation facilitates resource reallocation when, as now, there is need for large structural adjustments. So the final two points uh, I want to make uh, for, uh, is Monetary policy is not the right instrument. It actually may make things worse. Um, obvious question, uh, obvious point I made, I think, a few minutes ago, that uh, a major source of inflation is housing. And what is the major effect of raising interest rates to decrease the supply of housing? Why would you want to decrease, you know, making the inflation worse? Uh, so it is not obvious, you, you know, when you say uh, uh, if, you, if you raise interest rates enough, you can kill the economy and that will bring down inflation. But the cure is worse uh, than the disease. Um, there are, um, uh, and monetary policy also increases inequality. Um, you know, we, we've seen the disruption caused uh, in the case of SVB. But we should have been wary about increasing interest rates because it has pain not only on the financial sector, which led them really to rethink what they're doing, but also on people, <laughs> on unemployment. And what one has to remember is that uh, there are large disparities in the unemployment rates among different groups. And uh, traditionally, uh, um, uh, for instance, uh, young African-American males have an unemployment rate of four times that of the average. And that means when uh, the Federal Reserve says we're going to aim for a 5%, 5.2% unemployment, what he said is he's aiming for 20%, 21%, youth unemployment among uh, African Americans. And you, because of the, that will have effects not only today, but over the long term. Um, and globally, uh, uh, the, there are also adverse effects. Um, um, it's a blunt instrument with long and variable legs, making it particularly inappropriate, inappropriate in an environment with high uncertainty. And uh, I wrote this before, uh, the the uh, uh, bankruptcy, uh, but I have to say, with large financial disruptions and changes in the price of assets, uh, uh, the effects are now being felt, but they are really being felt now. Um, and finally, there are alternative policies, uh, real supply side policies, like uh, increasing uh, green energy, um, food production. We pay farmers for 50 years not to produce. We can start paying them to produce. Uh, not a, <laughs> a great original idea. Uh, people are worried about lack of labor supply. 
Um, I, th this is getting written very much from an American perspective. Uh, if we had uh, better child care, we could increase our labor supply uh, enormously. Uh, it's an obvious solution. We also, immigration policy. There's so many obvious solutions that directly get at the problem of, of if there is a labor shortage. I'm not sure. It says, hey, I, I'm more persuaded by the fact that real wages are going down that there isn't a real uh, shortage. I do think there are other policies. Uh, the high markup is related to increased market power, and that's related, uh, emphasizes the need for better antitrust policies. I think in Europe there's a need to revisit the policies for pricing electricity. Uh, more broadly, we need br better protective policies to protect people from the effects of inflation. And it makes, to me, eminent sense to finance those out of a windfall profit tax. Uh, and actually, those can be designed uh, in ways that will not adversely affect employment or, or investment and actually can discourage price increases. Uh, the important point about these policies is, like better child care, they will have benefits for our economy, whether I'm right in my diagnosis of inflation or if I'm wrong. But the policies that the Fed is pursuing have a disastrous effect on our economy if their diagnosis is wrong. So we ought to go for policies that work regardless of our, that are robust uh, to the diagnosis. I'm persuaded by my diagnosis, and I think there's increasing evidence on that. But I think uh, from a policy point of view, you ought to think about policies that work uh, even if your diagnosis, that have benefits even if your diagnosis is wrong. Let me conclude there.